let's talk about Peter Hitchens because Peter Hitchens is probably one of my favourite people because Peter Hitchens is is right about basically everything. Um, I mean, wouldn't you agree? I mean, he's 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 just he's just always right. Yes, and to preempt obviously the comments that we're going to get on YouTube because people may have seen since Carl has returned to Twitter that that Peter has not been Carl's biggest fan. Let's put it mildly. Nor mine, as we'll get into. Carl is not covering this segment today. He may do down the line. That's just kind of how the schedule works. But um, we did jigger it around because I accidentally got involved yesterday. But if you're looking to hear from him, not today, maybe in the future, but you can check out his very polite and cordial exchange with Peter on Twitter, both linked in the description here and as it continues to unfold. Yeah, have a look in the uh, the reading links and and, you, and you'll see a lot of the data laid out there. But but no, seriously, just, just to establish, first of all, you know, Peter Hitchens is a great guy. Um, mm. he, he's been correct about everything for a long time. I mean, we in this office, we've got a whole stack of his books, you know, lined up over there on the bookshelf. Um, you know, we've all seen his 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 contributions to Question Times and, and other interviews. Um, and you know, it's, it's it's very hard to put um, you know a cigarette paper between between where we stand on most things and, and himself. Uh, and and further than that, I mean, I would say that um, over the last couple of years, over the lockdown period, mm. Peter Hitchens was one of only two mainstream journalists who came out right from the very start. It was himself and James Dellingpole. And actually, James Dellingpole is sort of out of the mainstream at this point. He's so. become a pariah, yes. Yeah, so you, you could basically say that Peter Hitchens was the only mainstream journalist who pushed back against lockdown lockdowns right from the start although of course there are there are some now who were trying to claim that they were pushing back from the start even though they sort of got on board you know post the end of the of the third lockdown in in the defense of quite a few as well of colleagues that i've worked with at gb news the outlet didn't even exist till midway through mm. lots of the people on talk tv i know mark dolan for example um cut up a he got tons of ofcon complaints cut up a mask midway through some of them did wise up and it, it they they perhaps naively believed that this was a necessity. Um, however, yes, Peter was consistently from the start against this tyrannical overreach because he could see how it had been rolled out in other countries. Yeah. Um, so we agree um, with him. We think that he's a great guy and we think that he, he he's right on so much. That doesn't say uh, that he necessarily holds the same opinion of us. No, it, it would be it would be fair to say that while we agree with him on the assessment on the inevitable abolition of Britain, that he perhaps doesn't like our tact, or mm. perhaps or the fact that we're trying. Well, I'm I'm sure we'll get into it tweet by tweet. But what it seems to me is that he is irritated by people asking him for further solutions in a new context because he put the work in 20 years ago and he feels like nobody listened and i understand that frustration yeah. i really do but as i will we will later go through some of us hello weren't really of reading age when he wrote his 2003 columns that call for the destruction of the conservative party and so we are playing a bit of catch up but we have inherited the desolation that Blairism has wrecked on our culture and so now I look to him like a grandfatherly figure at times in the political sphere for some advice on how I can reverse how immigration has destroyed Britain and made it so that I can't get a house anymore. So this all started with an exchange. Um, should we throw up the, the very first of the tweets? Um, got that one, John? Yeah. So... Basically, this started with with Hitchens doing his normal thing of talking about how the fact that uh, that Britain has come come to steep decline and that essentially his advice to younger people is just to it's just to leave the country at this point. Well, he he to provide some balance, inconsistently, I will say, has said both. I'm not saying go somewhere, but I'm also not saying stay here, and then denied that he said we should leave at all later tweets with Carl. So it's yeah. at least unclear what Hitchens believes. So Carl basically put him to saying, you know, aren't we just sim simply abandoning you know, abandoning it to our enemies? You know, how, how can we do that? Um, and Peter decided, rather than respond um, in the manner that that was put across, pivoted to um, basically, I would say, a, a character attack on, on Carl. Well, he is saying that Carl is talking in grandiose language beyond his means, which is quite patronising, because I, knowing Carl, he just speaks like this off air, because yeah, he's read... there's no difference between the man on air and no, the he's, man off air. No, he's read plenty, and he incorporates these concepts and terms into his everyday vernacular. It's just how Carl is. 
Yeah. Now, this, you know, started off as a, as a fairly simple exchange, but you know, perhaps we can we can start clicking through to some of them. Um, there's, there's quite a few of these, and, and mm. I started writing this segment um, perhaps when there was about ten of them, and I kind of I just gave up at some point because we're up to about sort of thirty or forty, and these things are still going on. There might be more going on while we're live on air for all I know. Yeah. Well, one of Cole's contentions was, and, and Peter took issue with his characterization that Cole said, "I'm, I'm not being nearly as coarse as you." often assume I came from working class background, I've moved around to army bases and, and things like that. I've, I've worked my way up and been a self-made man using the new printing press of the internet to become a commentator in the same way that you earned your journalistic chops reporting on Moscow and the Cold War and now are battling against the, the pro-Ukraine, Russia is an evil, irredeemable country narrative of the present. And, and Peter took issue with the fact that Cole characterised him as not posh, necessarily, but having an aristocratic attitude to gatekeeping how people can talk if they are not affiliated with an accredited institution. And yes, Peter obviously spends a lot of time on Question Time. He has, he's on Talk TV, which itself is a maligned... Well, Talk Radio used to be a maligned outlet. Now Talk TV is a bit more mainstream. doesn't he? Uh, occasionally, he goes on right. Michelle Dubry's show yeah, okay. during the daytime. Now, look, so look, there's so many of these. John, why don't you just start flicking through some of them and just you know, throwing them up on screen. I don't think we need to necessarily talk to each of these because, you know, otherwise we'd be here for, for the rest of the day. Mm. But yeah, I mean, so your key point, so one of the ones that I did pick up on was he was basically um, pushing um, Carl to apologise over previous remarks that he'd made. And the interesting thing for me that is he said it would make you a more effective campaigner. Now, I sort of think, well, what does he mean by a more effective campaign? I think that what he means on that is that you might get invited back onto the BBC. Yes, you'll be more palatable to mainstream who are unplugged. Mm. I would hesitate to criticise because that is true for certain people who are not yet involved in what we call the culture war. However, and I'm speaking to my own family, for example, when I explained the situation to them, they were like, oh yeah, of course, because Carl's Kafka crap well-worded joke at Jeff Phillips, Jess, but slip of the tongue there, Jess Phillips's expense was that I'm not going to do something and you're going to get outraged and so you make yourself look like you're telling me to do that thing and so it's a bit of a gotcha, but it is yep. provocative and it is beyond the pale of what a lot of mainstream outlets would want, especially as well, some outlets, and I, I know that some outlets are keen to have Carl on, but Carl isn't that interested in mainstream television anyway because Very he's wise. got his little nest egg here. Mm. Some outlets who will have Carl on, other shows will not have Carl on even on the same network because they are trying to placate to advertisers who are pressured by activists who yeah. hate us and hate the networks themselves. And so in trying to moderate, they become tepid and left-wing. And I think Hitchens is operating from the paradigm of the idea that these institutions have some respectability, but they might have a few idiotic individuals in them rather than the British public sees them as irreparably contaminated. They want to tear up the license fee and increasing amount of people are coming to outlets like ours because we are honest yeah. with them. And so Carl doesn't need to placate the mainstream because all that happens is you are kowtowing to your enemies who don't want redemption anyway and it just makes you show kindness which they will take as weakness and sink their teeth into your neck. And and forgive me for using this word, but I'm, I'm going to use the word uh, the boomer. Now, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm fully aware that there are plenty of people of an age who are, who are very sensible and they can see through a lot of this stuff. However, there is a bit of a boomer mindset, and I think that's part of where Hitchens is coming from here. Um, for him, Carl almost doesn't exist, apart from that one thing that did make it into the mainstream media, mm. which was the exchange with Jess Phillips. Uh, Peter doesn't engage with anything outside of it. Isn't it? His world is the BBC, it's ITV, and it's a, it's a bunch of broadsheets. I mean, yes, mm. he does use Twitter, but he famously doesn't follow anyone on it. So he literally yeah. has no connection to, well, basically, the, the way that people under about 45 communicate. Well, he also doesn't, and, and I hesitate to interpret malintent with Peter, here, but I think he consciously constructs his Twitter account to also give it the same level of institutional clout as appearing on a question time appearance is, because he positions himself as above the fray by not only not following anyone, but if you notice here on all the tweets we're going through, he's not replied to anyone. No, he's, he's quote never retweeted to it to present it as some kind of yep. missile, uh, uh, almost like Burke writing reflections on the revolution back to that sermon that was given that was total nonsense as as if each tweet is is his declaration 
rather than engaging with this person one on one. It's it's a presentation of what he thinks to an audience rather than a conversation. And mm. I, I I don't think that lends itself as well to as constructive a a dialogue as we could have because if you're conscious about how you come across to the crowd you're not actually talking to the person instead what you're trying to do and this is often on television it's actually a good tack on television sometimes is that if you're trying to embarrass the holes in someone else's argument it's because you're not going to convince the other person that you're sat on a panel with four for ten minutes who has been booked because they're a token leftist or a token rightist or whatever it's instead you're trying to show the audience that the other person who has spoken is giving them an incomplete representation of the truth and so because they feel that that person is being dishonest they'll be won over by you by default and hitchens actually does that very well on question time when he went on recently with that royal college of nursing woman who accused him of being misogynistic and he didn't acquiesce to a single part of her framing and the audience applauded him rather than the nurses who everyone was still sympathetic to striking with because of their conditions. So I think it's very conscious how he frames his tweets. I'm not making an accusation of disingenuity, yeah. but I, I don't think it's conducive to actually having restorative dialogue. Yeah, he, he is brilliant in framing an argument. However, I think that this was unfortunate the way that yeah. he, he came back on some of these things so i mean the audience can draw their own conclusions looking at these tweets and like i say you can go to the reading list um on the podcast and you can get a full list of these tweets but i think carl and the, the wider loader eaters team conducted themselves very respectably and, and and very respectful to him in the way that they framed this and i think this is really quite marked when we get on to well i was going to say actually if we could just pause on harry's one um when harry pointed out to peter that Peter was saying to Cole, you must renounce this comment from X amount of years ago, which was done in the context of the internet rather than being written in a broadsheet column and subject to Ofcom regulations. Because as well, the internet discourse, hence the reason Lotus Eaters exists, because Carl's basically deputized a bunch of us because he also has family concerns. Um, the internet discourse has gotten deeper and more elongated, likewise with podcasts, and more serious because things just keep getting worse. And so we can't afford to be silly. And so Carl was provocative, more so back in the day, but it's not necessarily that he has to apologise for making a joke at the expense of someone who finds him contemptible because he, she would not give him like redemption either. And so Peter is operating outside the paradigm of the internet, and Harry points out here, by the same standard of saying that Carl should apologise to give himself legitimacy, should we all abandon the good works that Peter Hitchens has written over the years simply because he was once, a very long time ago, a Barmy Trotskyist? And he said, perhaps you could have dry addressing Carl's points, Peter. And Harry said that in all good faith as well. I know Harry, he's a very good friend. And Peter just says, a political opinion can't be equated with the public insult of Olympic coarseness. Slightly exaggerative, very subjective. And I would actually say that being a Trotskyite is... Well, far more contemptible be, be, being a Trotsky historically is, is promoting a a political agenda of action whereas you know anything that uh, Karl might have said was was basically just words so is, well, this, is also, this Peter reframing words is violence as as for the endorsement of what those statements would have said being a Trotsky guy is endorsing revolutionary terrorism because yes. even if you want to say oh Trotsky wasn't as bad as Stalin he justified revolutionary terrorism under the auspices that the bourgeois class are oppressors, and so any murder of them is self-defense. So he was an evil bastard. And Carl literally said, I wouldn't rape an MP, which is a, is a statement I support. Yeah. And then he also said, a long time ago in 1975, I resigned from the organization in question and have publicly and fully regretted my past positions. This is not a parallel. I have addressed his points. I, Peter, you, you didn't address his points because what Carl was asking for was your input on how to solve the rapid disintegration of Britain beyond move elsewhere because yep. most of us with our families, we can't afford to, we have our ties here and just sheer numbers of Brits cannot bail out of their own country. So it's not advisable for all young men, mm. particularly people like me who some countries I can't get into because of vaccine mandates, I can't afford to move, things are expensive everywhere. And with the regime of global cultural homogeneity, there is no escaping it. They have a global scope, which you should know, Peter, because if you were once a Marxist, Workers of the World Unite and the Spectre of Communism Haunts Europe has a global ambition. So these global socialists will not let you live a quiet life somewhere else just because you pick up sticks and move. Yeah, quite. And look, uh, I want to give Peter his dues. He's perfectly welcome to come on the podcast any time as he wants and, and put across it in his, in, his own, in his own words. But to really try and still man his argument... I do think that he's he's not saying that he, he thinks that our attempt to ask him for advice as to how to respond to the decline in Britain is irrelevant 
because the country has already declined to the point of being completely non-recoverable. And the only thing you can do at this point is you can give up. And it would almost suggest, again, make your own view looking at these, but it would almost suggest to me that he thinks that anybody who is saying that there's it is worth fighting at this point is just some LARPer. Uh, being um, some yeah I was going to say sorry to interrupt but I think it's it's more severe than that to go back to his former marxism to draw a parallel marx once said the history repeats itself first as tragedy then as farce i think because hitchens he is an arch contrarian and he has been right a lot so of the often. time which is because the times in which we live are so tragic that to be a contrarian positions you often in the right place. So he has been a modern Cassandra where people didn't listen. That's how he feels. Yep. He's, he's dead on. Um, he feels like his proclamations and trying to save Britain is the tragedy. Because he pours scorn on Carl for some edgy comments from years ago in a different context to a broadsheet newspaper, I think he sees Carl as the repetition of himself but a farcical misrepresentation, and so he isn't worth engaging with. Which, having known Carl and got gone from watching his content when I was younger... Um, to now working with him as a peer, which is a genuine honour. He is a lovely guy on and off air, and he's sincerely genuine. And we have got content planned to cover Hitchens' books well yep. before Carl came back on Twitter and, yep. and Hitchens engaged with him. So I, I don't think, even though Dr. Peterson wades in here and says he should come on, you should come on, Dr. Peterson, by the way, because not only would it be a great podcast with Carl, I'd love to talk to you, personal hero of mine. Um, I, I don't think it's going to happen because, hmm. not not just because... Peter would see it as a fruitless endeavour to try and save the country in the first place. Mm. But that he has just written Carlos specifically and us by association as not worth talking to because he doesn't meet the standard of propriety that he expects. And so I'd love for him to come on. Yep. And if if Peter sees this, because he did share one of our segments before that Nick and I did about his tweets with um, Michael Rosen, I no, believe, he, on he's grammar quite, schools. He's quite uh, tweeted me half a dozen times agreeing with the points I've made yeah. and, until I got involved in this conversation. It, now, would, it yeah. would be wonderful to have him on. I, I just don't necessarily hold out hope. Yeah, I mean, as you say, he thinks that we're not worth engaging with, although he did quote tweet us and well mainly Carl about 30 or 40 times so. he, he did me actually quite a few times so if we yes. go on to those John um, I, I just pointed out that Carl isn't being dishonest and then I positioned it to myself um, I wasn't trying to be egocentric there but I, I genuinely said okay I can speak from a man who has grown up listening to Carl and also grown up listening to you but I was born after your proclamations and I've inherited the mess that, that you predicted but I don't see you providing much of a solution and he did say, for seven long years after 2003, I set out in a national newspaper, explained an urgent solution, namely that patriotic conservatives should desert the Tory party, help to destroy it and replace it. Sorry you didn't notice you and about 10 million others. Now, I get the last bit, you and about 10 million, 10 million others. Totally valid, because plenty of people ignored him. I wasn't born till 1998. So 1997 was when the first wave of immigration happened. So, so this Can't is where I find it. it really difficult to follow him because with people like me, he he's got a he's got a case because I mean his big thing is that we should have abandoned the Conservative Party in two thousand and ten. Now in two thousand and ten, I was about thirty, and to my shame, I did vote for them, and I recognise it was a mistake now, but I didn't recognise it was a mistake at the time. Mm. I should have listened to Peter Hitchens, but I just wasn't that into him at the time. I I've subsequently become a fan, but where when he starts attacking you because you know, you were you would have been about fourteen in, in two thousand and ten. Uh oh, not even that. I've been twelve. Right. So, <sighs> the most I use my dad. My dad voted UKIP. So we did our part as a family. <laughs> there we go. And voted vicariously. If we can just go along, John, because he 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 re repeated a couple of times. He did four quote retweets of the same retweet for me. If we can go along, please. Um, and he's just saying, oh, obviously, people voted David Cameron anyway. He didn't listen to me. And so he said to me, you have no plan, no means of achieving whatever it is your hero, implying Carl, urges. You think that a big mouth makes up for tiny fists and that not understanding what is going on makes you braver than those who do. So he's accusing me of being ignorant and somehow emboldened by my ignorance and that I have a big mouth, which I don't deny, but also tiny fists as if I'm somehow impotent to enact change, which would also imply that I should be doing violent change were I capable of it. Do all those things if you like, just leave me alone. And he's saying to be left alone, but he was constantly responding to me and he responded to one of my tweets with, with, four, with yeah. four quote retweets as if it were a thread. So I, I responded to this. Um, if we can just go along, please, John. 
And I said, I, I did notice, I did notice your attack. And I have also continued to advocate for political alternatives and also alternative well, and, parties. And so just, and just look how respectful and polite you are. You, you, start, this, you start with sir. Well, I, yeah. I, this isn't me trying to be optic. No, this, is, this, is, just how, just this is just how you speak to somebody like him. Like, I, I really respect, for example, whenever an American UFC fighter gets in the ring and they say sir and madam yeah. to the to the medical professionals and the and the referees. It's just a good way to conduct yourself. And I said, the issue of electoral gatekeeping impedes the success. It, I don't intend to frustrate you. We, we value your advice. And he just said, I didn't advocate for alternative parties. I advocated the active destruction of the Tory party when it could have been achieved and when there was still time. Had it collapsed in 2010, as I urged, a proper new party could have been created. So I don't understand what our disagreement is when I said advocate for alternative parties to the Conservative Party and he says to destroy the Conservative Party and then create a new party but he's saying that it's not an alternative party so I think what he's saying is allow Labour to win once suffer for a few years and then hope something Conservative arises yeah. from the backlash but then I'm, I'm not keen also on ensuring even though we're going to get the Labour government definitely which is indistinguishable from the Tories at this point but ensuring that lots of people suffer 70s style inflation and austerity just to get what needs to come after. So I would I hope think, we can build yeah. a counter-movement in the meantime. I think his core thing is that he thinks that 2010 was a unique moment in history that will never be repeated. Right. So that was the opportunity for the Conservative Party to be destroyed. And look, the Conservative Party is, you know, we're getting polls out at the moment that sometimes put the Conservative Party in third place. Yeah. I don't necessarily feel that 2010 was as unique a point in history. And actually, we can still achieve a lot of the a lot of the things that he set out and for the reasons he set out, because Peter Hitchens, as we've established a number of times in this segment, is pretty much always right. Yeah. I'm just not prepared to give up the fight. And no. I don't see why somebody, especially of your age, who could not have acted on the advice that he gave back in 2010... Uh, why you basically and and you said it in your you said it in your first tweet. So are you basically saying that I need to flee the country or just watch my country fail? Yeah, that's and, not good enough. Even e even if it is true, it's you've also still got to fight. so dispiriting a condition that frankly, and and I'm a naturally pessimistic person anyway. If you were to renounce this existential battle and just extricate yourself from your obligated place to defend your civilization and do better as a man for yourself, for your family, for your community then what is the, the gap between I have no hope and I might as well end it quickly, it just shortens. So yeah. what's the point of even fleeing if there is a global scope of this ideology? His, his proposition is very nihilistic to the point of just saying, well, you give up and you might as well shoot yourself. And I don't want that. Like, I, not, not to get personal, I felt like that at 16. I don't want to be told that just because people yeah. are deliberately demolishing the prosperity that we could have. The safety we can. And actually, I've got to say, not to be blackpilled, as we often are on this podcast, but I, I genuinely don't believe that. I think that we have yeah. an opportunity now. I mean, just the fact that, um, you know, I have a regular podcast now where I talk about economic matters and people mm. actually want to hear it. I mean, it's the good. The feedback has been amazing yeah. on, on the videos that we put out so far. Uh, you know, I tried talking about Austrian economics and changes to the money system 10 years ago, and nobody was interested. Mm. Whereas now there was a rapidly growing audience for this. There is a recognition, and it's not just on the economic side, it's on all of these things, mm. it's on everything that we do. There is a recognition that establishment have failed us, establishment political parties, establishment, you know, finance systems, central banks, you know, NGOs. I mean, people are talking about the WEF. Whoever used to talk about the WEF? Yeah. Um, I, I, I was, to, I was yeah. blacklisted from Talk TV for doing a segment on it, and then a couple of... Weeks later, Mike Graham called everyone a conspiracy theorist on the network, who also does a show with Peter Hitchens. So there you go. On the same networks here, Peter. Come on, we're on the same side. I tweeted at Mike my segment when he called them a conspiracy theorist. And I said, I'd like to discuss it with you because I've done shows with Mike before. Mike called me a nobody, denied he'd ever followed me when people pointed it out, lost some viewers. And then he and a producer, who I won't name for possible reasons, blacklisted me from the network. But that was maverick because other hosts and producers went, that's not meant to be policy, we'll have you back on. That was last year. That was last year. W w was and that, we've now mainstream critique of the West. Was, was that when Mike was saying that he believed the Great Reset was a conspiracy yes. theory and people tried to tell him it's got a website, you can go to it? Yeah, that was, that was directly in response to that. And I was booted off the network for some time, despite having a Monday night show with Kevin O'Sullivan, who also does a podcast with Mike. And Kevin is actually yeah. a really nice fella. So... so. Um, I, I think that Mike is a massive tit, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try and make an argument for him. Um, so don't take my respect for Peter Hitchens to be you know, broad yeah. based support for, for for men of that age. Yeah, I was gonna say, can we can we go back, John? Just rather than um, just a couple. Uh, 
because what ended up happening was I I basically apologised for irritating Peter Hitchens because it, I I didn't intend to annoy him. I was actually sincerely asking for his input on how to solve this problem. And he said, then stop irritating me, even though he was repeatedly replying to me. Can you imagine how infuriating it is after 20 years of active cheerant campaigning to be confronted by some teenager... I'm 24, criticising you for your necessary. passive silence. Probably not, that is your tragedy. And I go back to history repeating itself first as tragedy than as farce. Well, then I suppose the third repetition but again is tragedy because my tragedy is, Peter, I look to you and your, your excellent predictions which have come true about the demolition of Britain and the untrustworthiness of the Conservative Party. And I say, because you're genuinely very intelligent, please give me help on the solution because I don't know enough yet to be as versed as you are. I'm trying my best. And instead, you insulted me. And I don't want to be a pussy, but that it felt like your dad telling you he was disappointed in you. You know, it just, yeah. it wasn't helpful. And, and, and I hate to sort of be blunt, but this, this, is, this particular is a straw man. We are not criticising no. um, him in the slightest way for his passive silence. We are well aware of his works. We are well aware of, of the content that he's produced over the years. We certainly do not think he's been silent and we have been listening to what he's been saying. Mm. Our only criticism is that you know this, this is our country and we don't feel that we can let it remain in this state. We feel that we have to push back as we can. Now, and another point on this is, you know, perhaps it, it is not even, um, you know, the, the nation of, of, of Great Britain as a whole. Um, you know, maybe there is a more. Uh, Carl will often say that um, he's he's looking for the English angle, the Kingdom of England. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm, in, I, I'm actually a Wessex nationalist. I would like to see the Kingdom of Wessex restored. I was, uh, I think it was the same day that I was on Mark Dolan's panel one evening. But um, Peter Hitchens wrote a column and went on GB News to explain it about how we should have an English Brexit from the Celtic nations because they're imploding and mm. they've got that sort of Celtic nationalism that Orwell described in Notes on Nationalism as a self-identity defined purely by a hatred of the English, and their only galvanising thing is antagonism for their neighbour. And that's not a healthy way to run a country. I actually kind of agree. I mean, I'll happily still watch Dan Killer's videos, even though Hadrian's Wall gets rebuilt, but it does seem difficult to to reforge a properly unified sense of, of national identity as the United Kingdom when we've had so much subterfuge for so many years. So again, Peter, right on that front... Would love to see how to formulate it, but instead you dismiss me. And uh, this was this was well was a bit far. He said, "You sound like a Trotskyite with your the glimmers of populist hope we had were suffocated by the international hegemony reasserting itself." Now, if he's calling me pompous, there, I mean, fair enough. I just type as I think. Perhaps I speak long windedly. I've been told to speak too quickly. Actually, that's apparently a thing. But I, what I was getting at there is okay. We had something like Brexit, which which Hitchin supported, and then immediately we've had. The stymieing by the courts, the insincere European Union deal where we've basically been a husband who was taken for all his worth in a in a divorce proceeding. We have the police still operating by Rainbow Europe to the point where the Scottish police use the term minor attractive person and they just blame the French for using it. Why using their same rhetoric? And then now we have assertions that we're going to re-enter the common market and we're also still under the rubric of the UN anyway, and Rishi Sunak was literally appointed Prime Minister without a vote. So, of course, the global hegemony of financial sectors, unelected international institutions, NGOs, and cross-continental bodies have told you, get stuffed. Your vote doesn't matter. We're just going to draw it out until you're fatigued, and then we're going to do what we wanted anyway. And so when I said that, it's me saying, okay, what do we do? And then he said, for me, all I have is internal emigration. Now, I don't know if what he means by that is I'm going to move from place to place, but I know Peter lives in Oxfordshire. I went, ran into him in the train station at Oxford once while he was on his way to his talk TV thing, funnily enough, back when I was staying there when I started this job. But Oxford itself is being divvied up into different sects according to the 15-minute city plan by the WEF, so they have the dark designs for your small corner of England, so you're not going to be left alone either. Or internal immigration means you're going to retreat to a place in your own mind and cut yourself off emotionally from the fact the country's being destroyed. But I can't do that because you've got 50 years on me, Peter, and also you shouldn't want to do that because in the Burkean sense, civilization is a, is a chain of continuity and you do have children. You know, I'm, I'm sure you've provided very well for them, but I'm sure you also want your kids and grandkids to live in a better country. I would like to live alongside them in that country. And he said, you already know what I think you can do. Why keep asking? I don't, because you didn't 
you said in one tweet, move. And then you said to Carl, it's a straw man to say, move and abandon England. I yeah. don't get what you mean. And, and, and the kids' point is the key thing. So, I mean, I am under no illusion the state that the West is in today, the state that this country is in today. But the reason I'm fighting is not actually so much for me because I think that the, the 2020s are going to be effectively a lost decade. I think the 2030s could be a period of significant disruption one way or another. I'm fighting for a better 2040s. And the reason I'm doing that is for my kids. I mean, I'm probably going to be too old to, to enjoy it then. But, you know, you want to leave a legacy. You want to, you want to do what you can. So, Peter... Uh, Look, we've got an audience. We've got an audience of 300,000, sometimes double that. If you want to come on and put your arguments and tell us why we're wrong, we will listen respectfully. So that's a genuine offer to you. If you want to get on board, get in touch. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast of The Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content we have on the site, such as the premium articles we do, this one on Against Lived Experience, with an audio track for Silver and Gold Tears, of course. If you'd like to find out what us are putting out, you can follow us on Getter at lotuseaters underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.